Hey folks, Greg Marshawn here. Welcome to another episode of the Virtual Instructor-Led Training Program brought to you by the Service Sales Academy. In this episode, we're gonna do another technical knowledge for you service advisors out there. This one on disc brakes. Now, why technical knowledge? Because the more you know, the more you're gonna sell. And the more you know, the more confidence you're gonna have and the customers are gonna sense that confidence. And then the more you know, the better questions you'll ask the technicians and the more you'll learn and the better questions you'll ask your customers in terms of diagnostics, in terms of what the customer's need is, etc. So the bottom line is knowledge makes you a better salesperson. Now, we're gonna talk about a real high level how brakes work here. If you're a technician, former technician, etc., you're gonna look at this and you're gonna go, but Greg, you forgot about this or you didn't say anything about that or well, that's, yeah, that's kind of how it works, but there's more to it. And you're right. There is, but we don't need to know all that stuff, okay? I'm gonna start with some real basics. How brakes slow things down? How do they slow things down? You ever wondered about this? It's the first law of thermodynamics, believe it or not. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but only turn from one form to another. We've got a ton of energy in that automobile flying down the road at 60 miles an hour, and when we step on the brakes, what has to happen? That motion energy has to get turned into heat energy unless you're talking about hybrids and then hybrids will turn some of it into heat and some of it into electricity. But the bottom line here is we're taking one energy and turning it into another one. So we're gonna talk about conventional brakes in this program, conventional disc brakes. Could be on the front of the car, could be on the back of the car. Doesn't matter if they work the same. And their job is to take the heat, I'm sorry, take the motion and turn it into heat. The more they turn it into heat and the better they dissipate the heat, the faster that automobile is going to stop. Good things about disc brakes, they're good at generating heat and they're really good at dissipating heat. They're in the wide open. And so all of that means we can get some really good braking force out of them. But they are in the wide open, right? They're open to the environment. They're open to, to the rain and slush and snow that are on some of your roads. And that can affect braking force. And then, you know what? They're not what we call self-generating uh, with brake force. They're not, they can't help us generate brake force. Whatever we put into the system is what they're gonna take and use to generate heat. So therefore, it requires some assist systems. Whereas drum brakes, they're self-actuating or, or self-generating. We step on the brake, they can actually multiply the brake force for us. So disc brakes require a few other parts, but you know what? They're pretty lightweight, they're really good at generating and dissipating heat, and so they work, and that's why we use them. What components are there? Well, of course, we got the discs, or some folks will call these rotors. So brake discs or brake rotors. We've got pads, and these pads are the friction material. More on those to come. Calipers, they're the, they're the thing that takes the pads and squeezes the rotor with it to generate that heat. And then we've got the caliper carrier, which is how the calipers mount. We're not gonna say too much about that. Hoses, lines that carry that brake fluid. And then of course, we've got the brake fluid. So the basic components of a disc brake system. Now, let's talk first about how this all works. We step on the pedal right? And that pedal is a lever. And so that lever action, as we step on it, actually generates more force. It multiplies the force of our foot to increase the force on the brake fluid to begin with. And then that brake fluid is pushed through the master cylinder where it's, the forces multiply a little bit more. And the force that that master cylinder generates gets transmitted by the fluid all the way down to the brake caliper. Now the caliper's job is to take those pads and squeeze the rotor with it, and I'll show you an animation on that in just a minute. But those pads, that, that force alone wouldn't be enough to help those pads slow the automobile. And so the caliper actually multiplies the force a little bit more, and then it clamps the rotor between those pads, and those pads are friction material, and as they rub against that rotor that's attached to the rest of the, the vehicle going down the road, it will generate an incredible quantity of heat. As that heat dissipates, that, that heat is energy. It's motion energy getting turned into heat energy. And so, therefore, we don't have as much motion energy. The heat gets dissipated and all this energy just disappears as heat. 
Of course, it doesn't disappear. It just moves along as heat, right? Okay, so it's, a, it's ultimately the, the clamping force that's initiated by our stepping on the pedal and forcing some brake, flu brake fluid through the system. Now, here's a quick animation as to how all this works. You see the rotor spinning here, okay? And then as we apply the brake, you see the piston moving outward and forcing those pads against the rotor to slow and ultimately stop the rotor, okay? I'll let you watch that one more time. We apply, rotor stops. Now, those brake pads, and I don't wanna to get too technical on this, but those brake pads are made up of, of what we call a friction material, and essentially we have to have something that's soft enough that it's not gonna grind up the rotor, but not gonna be real noisy and is actually gonna allow enough heat to generate. So we've got, you'll see non-metallic pads, semi-metallic pads, metallic pads, ceramic pads, all these things that customers may come ask you about. Non-metallic pads, they're really, really nice to the rotor. They don't grind up the rotor. They're, they're soft and squishy, if you will. And there's decent stopping force, but the problem is they don't handle heat really, really well. And so you get what we call brake fade, meaning I'm pushing really hard on that pedal and the car is just not stopping. Well, yeah, it can't generate any more heat and therefore we can't slow the car down anymore. All of that also results in a ton of brake dust. And so they wear out relatively quickly. So eh, they're okay, but generally we, we don't see many of these anymore. Now we've got semi-metallic pads that have some metal in there and, and the metal in there helps with the, with the heat transfer and the, and the heat generation. We need a little more force to apply these pads though to, to really get some, some stopping power out of them. And because they got some metal in there and, and less non-metallic friction material, they're much rougher on the rotors. But eh, it's a trade-off, right? You have better stopping power. They last longer than those non-metallics. Uh, and they are a little bit noisy. You know, you can, you can hear them sometimes. And they'll, 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 you know, all these parts shake or they vibrate as they're operating. And those vibrations are what we know as sound. And so sometimes that sound is a little bit too much for a customer. I'm gonna skip metallic pads because they just don't have a place in the, in the consumer automotive industry. They're more of a racing application, so you, you won't run into metallic pads. But I will say something about ceramic pads because these are very common now. They're great at generating heat, and therefore they're great at stopping an automobile. They're quiet because when they vibrate as they're being applied, that frequency is actually higher than what you and I can hear. So is there noise there? Yeah, there is noise there. There's quite a bit because there's quite a bit of shaking, but we can't hear it. They don't dissipate heat very well though. Um, and, and I say they don't dissipate heat very well. They generate heat, but they're not awesome at getting rid of heat and letting go of heat. They absorb a lot of that heat. And when they absorb that heat, they stay hot. And when they stay hot, that heat gets passed along to the, the brake rotors, the discs, whatever you want to call them, and to the other components. And so some of these ceramic pads will generate enough heat that you'll actually, you'll wear out rotors in terms of warping them before the pads will wear out too much. So all of this you get in the ideas is all compromise. None of this is perfect. We talked about that in the suspension. Uh, program as well, right? It, it's all a compromise. So we got to we, we got to make a compromise between longevity, between brake dust, between stopping power, between noise, between heat generation and heat dissipation. All of it's a compromise, okay? Now, the rotors are generally metal. Uh, rotors can be made out of all kinds of crazy materials these days, including carbon fiber. But generally, in our applications, they are metal. And when rotors go bad, there's a, a few things the customers are gonna notice. They may notice the rotors will warp. They may notice the rotors make you know, horrible noise and or the car doesn't stop because the rotors are, are corroded and, and they're no longer you know, shiny and smooth. Uh, or the dimensions will change, and we'll talk briefly about that in a second. The calipers, we can have, we can, so, so we've, got, we've got pads that are friction material, right? And they've got metal backing plates and they get this friction material. Metallic, semi-metallic, non-metallic, ceramic, and then those fit into the caliper carrier that 
allows them to operate against those rotors and those rotors are metal. And now we have the calipers that are gonna squish these pads against the rotors. We can have fixed calipers, we can have floating calipers. Now I didn't put in the slide you know, what those definitions are, but essentially the, the fixed caliper does not move. The pistons inside the caliper will move. And those calipers, you have to have at least two pistons and as many as four, six, I mean, you can have any number of pistons you want, depends on the size of the application. But the fixed caliper, the caliper itself does not move, the pistons within the caliper will move. And then you can have a floating caliper. And the floating caliper is like what we saw in that previous animation. The floating caliper, the piston will move, but as the piston acts on one side of the system, it will pull the housing against the other side of the system so that it's, it's it applies the other brake pad. So it pushes one pad in and kind of pulls the other pad on the other side in. So fixed versus floating caliper. And we can have every, floating calipers will generally have one or two pistons, whereas fixed calipers will have a minimum of two and they could have as many pistons as you want. I don't think I've personally ever seen more than six, but I've heard of eight. These are all bolted to the chassis. So, so that whole assembly is gonna sit there and have the rotor and pads inside it so it can squeeze all that stuff together. Now, go ask a technician to show you what this, what this looks like on an automobile and show you examples of fixed versus floating calipers if there's still some confusion here. When things go wrong, <laughs> what happens? What could possibly go wrong with a system like this? Well, we'll talk in a minute what customers are gonna, are gonna notice, but. In general, there's three things that can happen here. We can have warped rotors, we can have worn out brake pads, and we can have stuck calipers. But they all kind of work together to, to generate different scenarios and different situations. If the customer just has warped rotors, or the rotors have changed dimensions, you know, maybe something that we call parallelism. So, so the, uh, the, the rotors are not the same dimension as you go around the rotor. If you were to measure them, you'd have, and I'm gonna exaggerate this, uh, one measurement would be one inch, another would be an inch and a quarter, and then you might have an inch and an eighth, and then one inch, and then an inch and a quarter. And so it causes the pads to do one of these things as we apply the brakes. And of course, if the pads move, and they push back at the piston, they're gonna push back at the fluid. And the fluid's gonna push back at the brake pedal. And the brake pedal's gonna push back at our foot. And so you'll feel that brake pulsation. Well, the same thing if it's a warped rotor. If the, if the rotor is doing one of these things inside those pistons, or I'm sorry, inside those pads, then those pads are gonna push back at the pistons, and the pistons will ultimately push back at your foot. So if the rotor is warped or it's no longer parallel, you're gonna get a brake pedal pulsation. Of course, it'll be very, very rapid at high speeds. It can be caused by excessive heat in the system. You know, heat couldn't, couldn't be dissipated in the system. Maybe too much heat was generated towing a trailer down a long hill in the Rocky Mountains. And you generate a ton of heat and the system can't get rid of the heat. And so that heat has an adverse effect on the metallic components of the system, mainly the rotor, which then twists due to that excessive heat. You could also have a rotor wear issue. Maybe it's the wrong pads against the wrong rotor and the, and the rotor doesn't wear evenly anymore. And so you get that parallelism issue. Uh, generally, we blame it on heat. You know, could you have a really excessive wheel bearing play situation where the wheel bearing is really, really, really bad and get this? Yes, you could. Uh, generally, again, we'll tell the customer rotors are warped, most likely by heat. Now, where the heat came from could be Again, normal operation of the automobile, but they just happen to be towing a trailer down a really long hill and generate a ton of heat. Could be wrong brake components were installed at some point. And so they generate too much heat and the system was not designed to get rid of that much heat. Again, remember, it's all a compromise. How do you fix that? Gotta put new rotors and new pads. Now, a couple of comments here. You'll notice how I laid this slide out, right? Customer notices, that would be the customer concern or the complaint caused by, the cause, and then the correction. How do we fix it? Complaint, cause, correction, the three C's, okay? And if you use this to communicate, both with the technicians as to, all right, so what would the customer notice? What would their complaint be if, if this, you know, since you say this is going on, what, what would they notice? What would they be complaining of? So you can take that to the customer and build need recognition, right? And then to the technician, what, what would cause this? That's, Obviously your cause. And what do we need to do about it? 
and that's your correction. So, so talk to the technicians in terms of complaint cause correction and talk to your customers in terms of this is what you would notice, the complaints, this is what causes that, and this is what we need to do to fix it. All right, now we're gonna do the same thing with worn pads. Customer might notice a noise. Maybe those backing plates that are metal uh, the friction material is gone and we are metal on metal on those rotors now. That's going to generate a pretty good noise. Sounds like sand in my brakes. And of course, you know, it just started happening. Little inside joke, right? It never just starts to happen. By the time you go metal on metal and you get noise, you've heard something for a little while. Uh, maybe they've noticed poor stopping, grinding noise when they're stopping. All right, some sort of stopping or usually noise concern when those pads are worn out. And it can be caused by normal wear, it could be caused by a caliper was stuck and those pads were always engaged, and so that rotor just wore out that friction material in, a, in too short of an amount of time. Maybe they're, they're towing something and, and these pads wore out more quickly than they normally would. All right, but it's, it generally worn pads are caused by normal wear and or stuck calipers, frozen components. What do we have to do? We're gonna put new pads on it. But you know what? We never just put new pads on it because that friction surface on the rotor needs to be at least refinished. Generally, we replace those rotors these days. You know, turning brake rotors, just there's no money in it anymore. And it's in, in terms of the time that it takes, it's just more productive to put brand new rotors and brand new pads on an automobile and return the vehicle to the customer. Again, notice. Complaint cause correction, and we're gonna do it again with stuck calipers. Now, that animation that I showed you earlier, all right, that's available on Virtual Vehicle, and if you go to virtualvehiclemd.com, you'll be able to log in and pull those animations up, and they will show you some of the circumstances and in, in, in the, the complaint and the cause in terms of what goes wrong with these systems. If a caliper is stuck, What's a customer gonna notice? Probably pulling, maybe the grinding noise because a pad wore out. Um, this will cause uneven pad wear, so the inside pad or the outside pad will be, will be worn out more than the, the opposite pad. Uh, they may notice poor braking. They could even notice uh, shaking. I know when, when my calipers get stuck on my, my truck, they will generate so much heat, those rotors will warp temporarily, and that truck will shake like you read about until that piston suddenly snaps back, and then the heat can get dissipated, and the rotor goes back to, back to shape usually until it gets really bad, then it won't. So they'll notice pulling, grinding, poor braking, shaking, shaking when they apply the brake sometimes, uh, or they may just notice there's a lot of heat or a lot of brake dust on one wheel, okay? It's caused by corrosion. That, this, you know, in certain environments, that's just what's gonna happen. It's a, it's a part that's got a lot of heat. It's open to the, to the road salt. It's open to the environment, to the wet environment, and it's gonna fail somehow at some point. So it could be a mechanical failure as well. Um, could be a, a piece of sand gets, get, maybe there's a, a torn boot around the piston in the caliper and a piece of sand or road grime gets in there and, and lodges that piston in the on position. Because you gotta remember, I didn't tell you this, but you gotta remember, we apply those pistons, right? By stepping on the brake pedal and forcing the fluid, and there's a lot of force there that we apply. And so those pistons come out, but what, what allows them to come back? We never thought about that, did we? Believe it or not, the only thing that pulls them back is a rubber seal. That's it. And so if anything goes wrong with that piston, that, that, that the tension on that rubber seal can't pull it back, and there's not a lot of force there. Because we don't wanna pull it back a lot, because then it would take too long to apply the brakes. But if anything can overcome that tension that that seal is applying, piston's not gonna return. And if piston doesn't return, it's gonna wear those pads out. And it's essentially gonna result in a stuck caliper. So what do we have to do? We have to replace calipers, rotors and pads. Because if the caliper's stuck, we've probably been generating more heat than we wanted to. And so the pads are worn out and the rotors may actually have hot spots on them or may be warped. Now, Couple things to note about all of this, right? The proper way. I understand there's sometimes extenuating circumstances, but as a professional, I have to tell you the proper way to replace 
anything with the brakes is in pairs. If you put a left front caliper on, you've got to put a right front caliper on. Why? Because things change over time, and if you want to return the braking to the, the OE specification braking in the automobile, you've got to put both calipers on so we have even braking on both sides guaranteed. You also have to replace rotors and pairs. That kind of goes without saying, right? We're all used to that. And pads and pairs, we're used to that too. But it's the caliper piece that I don't see often enough. If one side caliper is slightly worn, it's not going to apply the same amount of braking force. If it's slightly corroded, it's slightly hanging up, and maybe we notice it, maybe we don't notice it. You've got to replace these things in pairs. That's the proper way of doing it. And then there's the brake fluid exchange. And I'm going to, I'm going to save the whole brake fluid conversation for a, another video, actually, because I, I was going to put it in here and I thought, no, you know what? We're going to make that standalone. We'll talk about selling brake fluid exchange. Uh, and I'll give you the technical aspect of that as well. But brake fluid, when it, when I say it wears out, its chemical properties will change over time, mostly through the absorption of water. And when it absorbs water, all those chemical properties change and ch exchanging brake fluid, taking the old fluid out and putting new fluid in will actually help keep all of these brake components operating in, in, in better operating condition, especially the calipers and, and wheel cylinders, those things with the pistons. It keeps the water out of there. It, it keeps these components from, from corroding. It keeps these components operating as they were designed to operate, and it keeps the brake fluid from boiling away with all this excessive heat. So always recommend a brake fluid exchange with a brake job. Generally, uh, manufacturers recommend it every 15,000 miles, although I've seen different specifications. But think about getting good at selling brake fluid exchange. And then we don't have to worry about that with advanced auto parts, but always use OE spec parts unless the customer requests something other. You know, don't, don't go replacing a semi-metallic pad with a ceramic pad unless you change the rotors with it because all these components were designed to work in conjunction with one another. So use the OE spec parts from Advanced Auto Parts and CarQuest Auto Parts, all right? And remember, brakes work by generating heat and dissipating heat. And if anything gets in the way of generating heat or dissipating heat, the car will not stop properly. The components, the pads, the rotors, the calipers, the lines, the hoses, the fluid, all of that stuff all works together to apply a force, generate heat, and get rid of heat. And then when you do replace these components, replace them in pairs and always recommend that fluid exchange. Okay, folks, go talk to your technicians, go check out Virtual Vehicle and, and learn some more about these systems. And until we see you again, keep up the great work and never stop learning.